In the 1920s and 30s, H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos not only started a new genre of horror, but also introduced some of the most iconic aliens in all of science fiction. While it's fairly common to find plushies in the form of Cthulhu at Walmart, you'll be hard pressed to find any of the other entities that make up his vast pantheon reduced to such a cute plushy form. The Mythos has been immensely influential to science fiction and horror writers alike, inspiring the likes of Stephen King, Neil Gaiman, Ridley Scott's Alien film, and many of Guillermo de Toro's fascinating creature designs. And the Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG is one of the most popular role playing games on the market, currently coming in third place in the US market and even eclipsing the popularity of Dungeons and Dragons in Japan. This incredible tabletop experience follows human players who take the role of investigators that stumble onto nefarious plots orchestrated by evil cults determined to raise Cthulhu and his brethren from their ancient resting places. But what if in real life you were one of those unlucky investigators? What if you were to encounter the godlike entities and aliens in Lovecraft's mythos in real life? Which one would you be able to survive? And which one would most likely reduce you to a raving maniac or a pile of gelatinous goo? Number 10, the Mego. They were pinkish things about five feet long with crustaceous bodies bearing vast pairs of dorsal fins or membranous wings and several sets of articulate limbs and uh, with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid covered with multitudes of very short antenna where a head would ordinarily be. That's from The Whisper in Darkness. For the unlucky investigator, stumbling upon one of the Migo's many secret bases is a risky endeavor. The Migo are an interstellar species whose primary base is located on a planet in our solar system they call Yogos, where they mine for rare metals. We know this world as Pluto. But they also have many bases on Earth. While the Migo lack the reality-bending power of many of the Lovecraftian entities cataloged in today's video, they are brilliant scientists. Though these strange alien creatures seem to be insect-like in appearance, their characteristics are more in line with certain fungi on Earth. Despite being an interstellar species, the Migo do not travel the cosmos in ships, but rather with their own immense wings. The Migo have been known to perform twisted experiments on human subjects. In many cases, this results in the unlucky human subject having their brain extracted and placed into a tube-shaped metallic device. This device can be attached to various peripherals to allow a subject to speak, see, and listen to their environments. An investigator would be lucky to escape these eager alien surgeons with their body and brain intact. Number 9. The Elder Things The Elder Things in at the Mountains of Madness are another example of an interstellar species who travel to Earth by way of their own membranous wings. Their appearance is somewhat plant-like. Their bodies are rigid, barrel-shaped things from uh, which spoke-like appendages radiate from. For millions of years, the Elder Things ruled our planet, establishing great cities on all the major continents and in the unknown depths of the ocean. Like the Migo, the Elder Things were brilliant scientists who may have accidentally created life on Earth and are responsible for the engineering of the dreaded Shogos that they used to build their vast empire. Throughout the mysterious, eon-spanning civilization, they waged war against Cthulhu's star spawn, the flying polyps, and the very shoggers that helped them build their vast empire, who rebelled against their creators. Over time, however, the Elder Things slowly degraded, losing the ability to travel through space and eventually dying out almost entirely. They left behind vast ruins, the largest of which rests in a mysterious, reality-defying set in the mountains of Antarctica. While it is unlikely that an investigator would ever stumble upon an Elder Thing in those vast ruins, there are rumors of survivors living in the ocean. These survivors maintain a scientific mind and are curious to take apart things both living and dead, especially humans. Such an encounter would likely be deadly, but there is at least a chance of survival. Number 8. Shoggoths The nightmarish plastic column of fetid black iridescence oozed tightly onward a shapeless congery of protoplasmic bubbles faintly self-luminous and with myriads of temporary eyes, forming and unforming as pustules of greenish light all over the tunnel-filling front that bore down upon us. That's from At the Mount of madness. Shoggoths are massive, shape-shifting, protoplasmic monstrosities that can reach up to 15 feet in diameter. If an investigator were to have the misfortune of meeting one, they might describe their charging form as something akin to a locomotive, and it would be very likely the last thing that they ever laid their eyes on. Though they were created by the Elder Things to be mindless instruments, the Shoggoths steadily increased their intelligence over time until they at last rebelled against their creators and destroyed their once great civilization. Looking to the Necromonicon, investigators might take comfort in the claims of of its late mad author, Abdul Alzared, that no such beings exist on Earth. But they would be fools because tucked away in the Earth's unknown crevices and great ruins, some Shoggoths still lie. It is possible to survive an encounter with the Shoggoth, if only because their size and habit of charging and destroying everything in their path make them easy to spot. Number 7. Starspawn they all lay in stone houses in their great city of Relair, preserved by the spells of mighty Cthulhu for a glorious resurrection when the stars and the earth might once more be ready.
That's from The Call of Cthulhu. The Starspawn take on the likeness of Cthulhu himself. These creatures are often described with cephalopod-like features as well as two glowing eyes and a set of great wings. In the feverish visions described by artists under the influence of Cthulhu's mind-warping presence, these things have also been described as possessing humanoid bodies, but that's not always the case. Though they are not nearly as large as Cthulhu, many texts suggest that they are from the same species. Given that, any human foolish enough to face a Starspawn may be subject to similar feats of strength and magic. Number six, the Haunter of the Dark. I see it, coming here, hell wind, titan blue, black winds. Yog, Sothus, save me. The three-lobed burning eye. That's from the Haunter of the Dark. Poor Robert Blake made an unfortunate discovery upon entering an abandoned Gothic cathedral in Providence, Rhode Island. Staring into a mysterious box holding an otherworldly black gem, he saw terrible visions of alien worlds and sunken cities. And unfortunately for him, this unknowing act also unleashed a creature often thought to be one of Nyar Lothotep's oldest forms. When an investigator peers into the shining trapezohedron, they experience visions, but at the cost of releasing the Haunter of the Dark, a dangerous entity that establishes a psychic-like link with uh, one who opens the box. The affected investigator will begin seeing visions of the creature's activities. For Robert Blake, this strange connection to a being engulfed in smoke with great shapeless wings meant he had a front row seat to its escape from its cathedral prison in the midst of a violent thunderstorm. In the chaos, the creature made its way to Blake's apartments. Later, he was found dead, an expression of complete terror written upon his face. The only discernible feature of the Hunter of the Dark seems to be a single crimson eye with three lobes. Encountering this entity could be deadly, especially if the investigator has made a psychic connection with it, but the creature does have a weakness. The Wanderer of the Dark avoids light sources at all costs. So, you know, carry a torch. Number 5. Cthulhu, Great Priest of the Great Old Ones According to records kept by the Elder Things, inscribed in great murals in the uh, ruins of their Antarctic city, Great Cthulhu came from a place known as Zoth, with its star spawn 350 million years ago. It was then that it forged the terrible city of Relay and various other places whose names have been lost to time. At some point, something caused the corpse of Relay to sink beneath the ocean, entombing the great priest of the Old Ones and other members of his race in the Pacific Ocean, where he lies dead and dreaming, waiting for the stars to be right once more, so that he and his star spawn may rise again and rule the earth. Artists who have possessed idols made in the being's image have described Cthulhu in many ways. These artists are rumored to suffer intense hellish visions when under the influence of Great Cthulhu. Though Great Cthulhu may or may not be the most powerful of the old gods, there can be no doubt that unlucky investigators who find themselves facing down the great priest himself are certain to be doomed even if they survive the encounter. Number four, the king in yellow, Hastur. Hastur the Unnameable has three main forms. His home is thought to be near the star of Aldebaran, where he lives beneath the sea. There are some who believe that there is some kinship between Hastur and Great Cthulhu. Others who believe that the beings are one and the same, but split into two knowing halves. Whatever the case, Hastur has far more freedom than Great Cthulhu, and may have designs on destroying the cosmic order that the Old Ones have maintained since Azathoth accidentally created our universe. The King in Yellow may be the most famous and dangerous manifestation of all, as it possesses free will, apart from Hasta and its other two avatars. Ruling a kingdom known as Carcosa, where Sky is dominated by twin black suns, the king in yellow spreads his influence through an infectious cult. Their main means of recruitment is to give potential members a small cycle with profound psychic properties. Known as the yellow sign, this strange marker is rumored to have a corrupting influence on mortals. Those who have seen the yellow sign are considered to be chosen by Hastur's cult and rumored to fall under the king in yellow's influence. Especially weak-willed investigators who find themselves in the possession of such a sigil may find themselves raving mad within a month's time, even if they don't end up serving the king in yellow directly. Number three, Nyarlathotep. Nyarlathotep, otherwise known as the Crawling Chaos, is sometimes considered to be the most powerful entity in the mythos. But unlike other entities, Nyarlathotep possesses oh, 1,000 different forms, each of which maintains a will of its own, yet all are guided by one single will, that is, Nyarlathotep. Nyarlathotep seems to favor appearing to human beings, often taking shapes that conform to their cultures. His avatars will offer promises of riches or fulfillment of an unlucky investigator's deepest desires, but these promises always lead to the furthering of his ultimate goal of sowing chaos and bringing about the return of the Great Old Ones. Ultimately, to encounter Nyarlathotep in any form is to count ruin, if not the very end of humanity as we know it. Nyarlathotep may not outright kill an investigator, but he will make them wish that they were dead. Number two, Azathoth. 
As a Thoth exists at the center of the universe and appears different to anyone who views his ancient star-sized body. He is the most powerful being in the mythos, but lacks any knowledge on how to consciously use that power. Many believe that he has been there since the beginning of time. He dreams our universe into being, and should he ever wake from his eternal slumber, the dream that is our reality would crumble. To prevent this, the blind idiot god is constantly lulled to sleep by amorphous beings known as servitors of the outer gods, whose tendrils wrap about ancient flutes that lull the mindless force of cosmic nature to sleep. In the unlikely events that an investigator gazes upon as a Thoth's form and somehow survives, they are sure to end up a raving lunatic for the rest of their days. Number 1. Yog sothoth Sometimes described as being comprised of orbs or holes in the fabric of space-time, Yog sothoths true size is unknown, and while the deity might not have the all-encompassing power of Azathoth, it is said that he is capable of instantly comprehending and knowing anything. Yog sothoth dwells between the barriers between dimensions, manipulating the laws of reality and even possesses the power to break them. While Azathoth is able to create and destroy an entire universe, yogg sothoth is unable to manipulate matter on such a large scale. But the being's omnipotence seems to suggest that in some ways it has near equal power to Azathoth. Some have suggested that while Azathoth dreams our universe into being, yogg sothoth is the connecting tissue that exists between dimensions. yogg sothoth is often referred to as the key and the gate, and is rumored to have spawned many entities that can be found in the dreaded Necromonicon, including that of Hastur. But the being seems to have a keen interest in taking biological form, having done so in one particularly gruesome case in a rural town called Dunwich back in the years 1913 to 1928. More often than not, these offspring take on the characteristics of their master, and their horrific amorphous mouth-covered forms are usually invisible to the naked eye. The reason for this fascination with siring half-mortal offspring is unknown, but some believe that this is the key to yogg sothoth's destroying the shackles forced on it by the old ones to bring forth a new age where humanity will cast aside its morals and the old gods will return to our universe in this way yogg sothoth may very well be the most dangerous being in all of the mythos